My name is Seth Law. Uh, I'm a I'm, I'm, I'm the managing consultant of the application security team at Fishnet Security. Uh, our whole team here today is from Fishnet. Um, I've been on the application security team there for about the last five years, doing everything from web assessments to mobile assessments, obviously, for the last couple of years. This has been a big chunk of my time, my professional time, uh, and hence the reason that we're talking about automated assessments for iOS devices. Uh, with me, I have Justin Angler, who is one of the senior security consultants on the application security team, Josh Dubik, who's only a consultant, he's the low man on the totem pole this year, and Devo, or David Vo, I should say, we call him Devo just because we think he looks funny, like Devo. <laughs> um, anyway, so Devo is actually on the mobile security team at Fishnet. Um, he was on the application security team for a while and then moved over, decided to go to the dark side. Anyway, so, Today we're going to talk about CIRA. Uh, CIRA stands for Semi-Automated iOS Rapid Assessment. Uh, really, this is a tool that we've created to scratch an itch that we have. Uh, it's for security analysts or security consultants who are looking at mobile applications and trying to assess the security of those applications. Uh, there's both a forensic and an AppSec component or an analysis component. Um, we're automating those processes or those things that we do every time we look at a mobile application. Uh, so you see a list here, the binary uh, decryption of the iOS apps, uh, iOS keychain decryption. There's a lot of good stuff that's stored in there and we want to know about it. Uh, file decoding, there's a lot of different file types that are floating out there on the iOS device. And then file system snapshots. Uh, we'll talk about an assessment workflow when we get later on into the application. But basically, Sierra grew out of a, a bunch of scripts that we had to do each of these things. And we're trying to combine it all together to give us an easy way to go about assessing these applications. I've got a couple screenshots that show us you know, what Sierra currently is, the current state. And obviously, it's come a long way within the past couple of months by itself. Uh, there's a copy of the tool that's on the CD, the Black Hat CD. Uh, yeah, don't use that one, right? It's, it, it has like one or two functions. I think it does snapshotting, and even then it doesn't do it that well. Uh, the release that we're going to put out online within the next couple of days has everything in it that we're talking about today. So all these functions that you see up there, the cruise control stuff we'll talk about, you know, stepping through the different portions of an application assessment of mobile applications, installing apps, you know, actually driving the phone itself, uh, the manual testing that we'll get into that is, is tied up in the cruise control, and then, you know, the other things, you know, there's certain dependencies that we have. Uh, I also have a screenshot of the manual section, uh, so snapshotting file system, diffing uh, one snapshot against another snapshot, so you know what's new and what's changed on the phone, searching through that snapshot, analyzing, all that kind of stuff. You know, each of these, you know, each of these points we'll talk about, one of us today, and how we developed it, what the thought process is behind it, and how it, how it can help you in an application assessment. Before we get into everything, I wanted to have a quick disclaimer, right? Don't break stuff that's not yours, right? You shouldn't be doing this on somebody else's phone. Even if you can SSH into their jailbroken iPhone, that doesn't mean that you should run some of these commands. You can seriously screw stuff up. Uh, don't use a device you care about. You should have a throwaway one when you're testing this stuff. Otherwise, you know, we've had to re-jailbreak phones multiple times while we're doing this and experiment with it, experimenting with these utilities, making sure that it all works. And don't use accounts that you care about. You know, for sure, you know, Apple's probably going to come up after you if you download hundreds of thousands of apps all within a couple of days. Um, you know, granted, they'll just, they might just take your money too. They seem to be good about that. Uh, lastly, don't blame us if something goes wrong. This is unsupported code. If you want it supported, come talk to us first. Um, and don't blame Fishnet. We've actually developed all of this on the side. Uh, Fishnet is, you know, obviously our day jobs, but this is this is what we care about. This is what we do after hours. Um, so, you know, yes, we're associated with them, but really this is separate, a separate entity from Fishnet. So, first of all, I'm going to step through the, the background of why we're testing the apps and, you know, what we're currently seeing out in the, the marketplace. Uh, 
Um, Apple just released their latest quarterly earnings. Uh, they came out and said they have over 650,000 apps in the App Store now. Um, 250,000 of those are for the iPad, obviously, you can all read. Uh, that's a whole ton of applications. Now, there's a lot of security considerations that go into that, right? Um, you look at those numbers, there's over 1,100 new apps released daily on the App Store. And how much thought do you think the developers are putting into the security of those applications? Or the privacy implications of the data that they're collecting about you, the geolocation information, or whatever else it is. Each, app, each iOS device out there has an average of 108 applications on it. You know, you think about your iPhone and the different things that you do with it, from you know, banking to Google Maps. You know, what, what do those applications know about you, and how are they protecting that data within the application itself, but also as it goes online? And that's, that's exactly what we're looking at. That's what we're paid to do uh, during the day, but it's also what we've been looking at after hours. So Apple's testing, in this case, is the big unknown. Uh, you know, I, I know we had a talk today from Apple and their iOS security team came in, told us a bunch about their security features. Uh, we walked into that, listened to it for a little bit. Obviously, we were still preparing stuff, so we didn't catch it all. But the interesting thing was is they talk a lot about the security of the device itself, how they they sandbox applications, right? They only allow you to do a specific number of things. Uh, developers out there have learned to game the system, right? To figure out how they can release their applications so they're pushed through the App Store registration process as fast as, pro as possible. You can go out there, I've got a screenshot here of a checklist that one developer has come up with of how to get their application promoted through the, through the, or to the App Store. And you'll notice that in this list, is not one thing about security, right? It says, oh, make sure your application doesn't crash, make sure the, uh, the UI is consistent with Apple's rules, uh, make sure there's you know, screenshots, that the descriptions are right, but it doesn't talk about protecting geolocation information or making sure that you're not sending the contact lists out to your you know, third-party web service or whatever it is. It's all about following Apple's rule, rules. Now, Apple, you know, Granted, they're a corporation. What they're looking at is how they can you know, best enforce their rules and make their money. You know, they're going to reject your app if you're not following their rules for in-app purchases. They want their 30% cut or you know, something along those lines. So they're not necessarily looking at the testing or the security testing of these applications as it rolls through their process. At least I haven't talked to anybody from Apple that, it, that has even addressed this so far. So there's a lot of information out there that's up for grabs. I talked about the contact data. Uh, you know, there's apps that are out there that have access to contact data that don't necessarily need it. Um, the calendar as well. The Apple APIs to actually access this, inform access this information are not restricted. Uh, any application can call and read your contact list and send it off right now as of the current version of iOS without asking you permission. I've been hearing rumors that iOS 6 will actually implement this. It'll be much like the geolocation information that you have to authorize an application to do that. But even when you authorize an application, like in geolocation, how long does it store that data? Right? We saw Apple have a huge problem with this a couple years ago that you know somebody could pick up your iPhone, back it up, and then they could actually track where you had been for the last two years because it was all on the iPhone itself. Now. Now, Apple doesn't do this anymore, but what about the applications that are on your phone? What about Google Maps? What about Facebook? You know, LinkedIn, every, every social media application that's out there has access to this information and may store it. And yet we don't necessarily know whether they do or not. So that, that goes along with that. Um, Security testing, as far as this goes, you know, Apple's policy versus actual security, right? They're more concerned about business than they are the security of the application. Other things that are required. Um, when we're talking about assessing a mobile application, there's a strong technical com component, right? You've got to have knowledge about a number of things, network traffic analysis, iOS file system, you know, it's basically a free BSD system underneath the hood, right? That's what Darwin is based off of. Um, and not all of us are free BSD experts, obviously. 
right? People come from different backgrounds and they won't necessarily have all that, that base knowledge to assess these applications and how they are actually tied into iOS. So, you know, all this stuff is a need to know for somebody to really test these applications. Um, obviously, we know some of this, but we have our strong points and our weak, weak points. Um, jailbreaking, it's point and click, yes, but you know, not the average person probably doesn't have a good idea of how about how to go about jailbreaking their iPhone. You know, other things, cryptographic attacks. Right? The ones that we see most common on you know the iPhone, you know, everything's encoded in Base64. Yes, I know Base64 is not encryption, but a lot of people and a lot of developers seem to think it is. Um, iOS application development, what APIs are necessary. If you do a strings on an Apple binary that's been decrypted, you know, what are the things that you need to look for to know whether or not it's accessing the contact list? That's one of the things that's easily done if you know what iOS, iOS application development looks like. Um, and then web app, web app security as well, how it's contacting the web services on the back end. You've got your SQL injection problems, your cross-site scripting. you got OWASP and the OWASP top 10 and the OWASP mobile top 10. Hey, there's just a number of different things. And this is why we feel that CIRA is relevant, is it, it, it takes a lot of this and makes it accessible to a lower level, uh, you know, not necessarily security ninjas, but people that have a good base understanding and can apply that to the applications. It'll give them a way to deal with these different vulnerabilities that exist on the mobile applications. There's also a huge time investment involved, right? You, you, if you're talking about 1,100 new applications a day, this is, I mean, a typical mobile application assessment from Fishnet takes between uh, probably 40 and 80 hours. Right? If we're really looking at the application, we're forensically analyzing the device after we get done using it, um, you know, we're decoding everything, we're you know, fuzzing every field that we can find, this is a long time to spend for 1,100 applications a day. Uh, even for 100 applications a day, you're never going to catch up. And this doesn't even take into account those 649,000 other applications that are already in the App Store. So there's, there's a great need to automate this and to have multiple people looking at this problem. The current automation that exists out there for, for applications that are on mobile devices or on iOS devices is pretty much insufficient. Uh, there's not a lot out there that does any of this. There's a lot of piecemeal uh, tools that are out there that we'll, we'll talk about in a little bit. There's also MDM solutions, the mobile device management solutions, that blacklist applications. Hey, they know that path accesses the contact list and tries to send it off somewhere else when it shouldn't. So they'll deny you actually putting that application on the phone. But this doesn't do, any, do us any good for applications with unintentional security holes. Uh, things like SQL injection or you know, storing username and password in the plain text on the phone or sending it unencrypted over a Wi-Fi link, whatever it is. So, you know, all of this stuff is just leading to the fact that, you know, Sierra is, is relevant. I guess what, I, what we're saying, you know, there's more things, you know, we need to speed up the discovery of these vulnerabilities uh, with regular expressions and file type detection. Obviously, this slide got a little screwed up. You saw this a couple of months ago, uh, right? Facebook and uh, Dropbox were both listed as, oh, you know, these had, they have these huge security holes because we found the session IDs in plain text on the phone itself, you know, somebody used iExplorer and looked at their phone and could actually pick that out and they sent it to somebody else and they could access their account. Hey, this is bad, but it, you know, it's just basically storing the session ID unencrypted on the phone. There's ways to protect against this, but this is also something that is easily found, right? We know what the name of a Facebook token is. We should be able to search through every application and see if they're storing that Facebook session ID or that Facebook token. Uh, we can write a regular expression to do that. Uh, we can decode plists. We can decode SQLite databases and access the, this information. The current tools that exist out there, the tool set, like I said, there's proxies available that will you know, we can send all our traffic through, uh, pick your favorite one. There's specific issue finders and specific tools that are out there. Uh, we're going to try and bring these together with Sierra. I, obviously, some of the stuff that we're doing is replicated in other tools, and we've tried to pick best of breed tools to do this for us under the hood, uh, where we haven't actually implemented something ourselves. So, you know, Haculus that'll do binary decryption, and, you know, iPhone data protection, uh, uh, 
code on Google Code. Actually has a good, uh, a lot of good stuff that'll pull information from your phone. Um, anyway, if you've got you know questions about any of those, come talk to me in a little bit. Now, one thing that we found as we were implementing Sarah is full automation is hard. Right? This is not something that's easily done with a mobile device. Uh, Apple doesn't necessarily give us the tools, especially on an unjailbroken device, to go in and drive the application itself. Uh, one of the requirements of Sierra is that you have a jailbroken device, and there's a couple of tools that come down from the city of store that will actually let us drive that interface and click on things, put input uh, data into specific fields that we find, and attempt to fuzz the application. Um, now, the problem that we found is these app interfaces are very unpredictable. It's hard to know how different buttons and different fields have been implemented. Everything is a custom application. Depending on the framework that the developer used, whether or not they used the Apple, you know, the actual Xcode to develop their iPhone application, determines what, how easy it is to actually step through those screens and determine what it is that we're dealing with. So we're, we're moving through this and we will be able to implement this. Uh, it's just taking a lot longer than we expected when we initially started looking at the problem. And some of these vulnerabilities are always gonna require you, uh, human interaction. Right? Um, this goes back to flaws that are also found in other applications, web applications, authorization issues, business logic flaws, encodings and encryption. A lot of these are readily apparent to a human looking at the vulnerability or looking at the code, but an application or something automated is not necessarily going to be able to pick that out. We're, gonna, we're doing our best, but we're never going to be able to approach fully what a human can do. So the first thing we want to show uh, first demo we have is autopilot, right? So this is showing basically our proof of concept of driving a mobile application or an iOS application. Justin, you want to talk to this a little bit? Yeah, so he's going to play it once, and it's really fast. So we'll play it a few times so you can see what's going on here. We're only showing one little spot. Essentially what we're trying to do here, you can see at the very top, it's kind of hard to see on the screen, you can see a mouse pointer on the iPad. Uh, first thing to know is that this isn't the, the simulator, this is an actual device we're running over uh, reflection so that we could actually get the screen and, and record it. But uh, what our code does, it hooks into uh, the app in memory and tries to figure out, it, it gets a dump of the, the configuration of all the objects on the screen and then tries to figure out which things could be clickable. So there's a bunch of different heuristics we use. We look and see if it says it's enabled or if it's a type button and some other things. We go through them all and then um, it can also generate a click event at that spot. Sorry. So, no, it's fine. So. Let's play it one more time. Yeah, we'll play it one more time. You can see on the left it's detected something and it's showing you where it is and then the user can decide if they want to click that or not. Uh, in our kind of demo mode, that's how we did it, because if we just had it click everything it thought it was a button, we would get into an inf infinite loops, where like you would add a new contact to the contact list, and then go back, and then add another one to the contact list, and then go back, and so on. Um, solving this to make it, make it heuristically determine what a new screen looks like versus just, you know, okay, a new contact was added to the contact list is a really tough problem, and it's something we're gonna keep working on. Uh, but for now, we wanted to show you Autopilot to show you that we're almost there, but that part's not going to be released in the stuff we're, we're putting out tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, future growth and what, what we're looking towards, what we really want to achieve with Sarah is something that we currently see in web application scanners. Right? It understands HTML. It can go in, it inputs fields, uh, and then clicks go and tries to submit those values to actually see how the application responds. And that's really the goal that we are driving to here with Sarah. So Seth brings up a good point. What we're trying to get here is like a web crawler, but it's an application crawler. A web crawler in a lot of ways is easier because since HTTP is stateless, you can look at all the different things that are in a request and determine, okay, if I've sent the same uh, URL parameters and same post parameters and same cookie parameters, it's probably the same thing as I did before, so I won't get into loops. We don't have any control over that because all we can do is click. We don't, because each app on the App Store represents its state differently, we can't really look at it internally unless we were going to write that custom for every single app, and at 1,100 apps a day, we're never going to be able to do that. So we're looking for a solution that'll handle kind of the 80% 
and and we'll have to just cover the rest manually. Yeah. So it, when it really comes down to it, you know, true application security is only assessed between a manual tester, human intervention, and automated tools. Uh, you know, we've seen this already with web app security. Um, yes, there are scanners out there, and they do a really good job with 80 to 90% of the vulnerabilities finding and identifying them, but there are false positive and, uh, positives and other things that come up, and a human actually looking at those vulnerabilities can make the call on whether or not they are true vulnerabilities or not. Uh, and there is a lot that we can do as far as catching traffic, watching traffic patterns as well, to eliminate those false positives, but they're always going to be there, and there's always going to be a human component. component. But as much as we can limit the time that a human has to look at this, the better it's going to be. Now, before we get into the actual CIRA workflow and, and you know, what we've implemented, I just want to give props. Uh, you know, there's a lot of, we're, we're standing on the shoulders of giants is really what it boils down to. The jailbreak teams, um, a lot of these tools that we're using, Haculus, like we're using Clutch to actually do the uh, binary decryption right now, and it's basically because it, I wanted to speed up the time. Yes, we could implement it, and we probably will in the future, but they've already got a solution out there for us, so we're pulling those as well. Uh, there's a lot of white papers out there. You heard some people speak today. Um, I can't even say Jason's last name. He said Ziarski. You know, if you look in our white paper that's on the CD as well, we've got a full you know, list of references to white papers and things that we're using actively in the tool, you know, how we implemented different algorithms and how we've actually applied what they talk about in a, in a technical manner. Okay, so like Seth was saying, um, you know, analyzing a device is a very manual and tedious process. So the typical assessment workflow is, you know, taking a snapshot manually, installing an app manually, snapshotting again, doing some things with the application, logging into the application, and, you know, setting up your profile on the application, taking another snapshot, and so on, and then analyzing those results. So where CIRA comes into play is we kind of try to automate that process. So CIRA, some of the nice features of CIRA, we can install applications. Currently, right now, we can install either an application by a simple search query. If you want to install Dropbox, CIRA will automatically install that. If you want to install, say, the top five apps on the Apple App Store, top featured apps, CIRA can do that. And during this process, CIRA will record the application activity. So CIRA can record it before, post-install, and it'll just display some results. Okay, so that's great. We can automate that process. So what about driving these applications? So you saw kind of a brief demo of what, you know, some of the capabilities are. Um, right now we can fuzz for, we can look for form fields. We can look at the buttons that are on the page. Um, and eventually, we want to incorporate fuzzing as well. Got to install demo here. So we, we've got a short demo to actually show you what the install looks like. You, you saw us driving the application. Now, you know, since the App Store is one of those things that's very easily understood and we can parse pretty easily with the current... Uh, utilities that we're using, we've actually gone ahead and implemented installing applications, you know, programmatically is what it boils down to. You've got, again, your, your iPad on the left, uh, Sierra's on the right. Um, you know, this, he, this is actually part of, you know, the install from Cruise Control, but we're choosing to install an application. In this case, you know, it's what, you know, some time management application. It fires up the App Store, clicks on it. You actually have given Siri your username and password for the App Store. So be careful if you are going to use this because it will charge your credit card if the application costs, right? Um, and then it, you know, goes, goes ahead and installs the application. It does it, you know, it, we sped it up a little bit here. It takes a little while to actually do that because you've got to pull down all the code and things like that. Um, but we'll show how we actually drive that further uh, later in the presentation. And at any point in the process, we can run snapshots. We can run a diff against snapshots, so you can take snapshots um, depending on any time in the process. Um, so, okay, that's great. So what if you want to monitor network traffic? Well, we got you covered there. We can set up a, a proxy. So you can use your favorite proxy, such as Burp, and you can monitor traffic. Okay, so 
one of the main things that it's kind of difficult to do when analyzing these binaries is, well, they're, they're encrypted. So how can we uh, speed that up? Well, Sierra will decrypt those binaries for you. And what we're looking for is we're looking for malicious information in those binaries. You know, what, what exactly is stored in those binaries? Um, you know, what APIs are these applications using? You know, if, if it's not a messaging app, why is it hooking into the message API? You know, those are things that we want to look for. Um, we also want to check if the keychain's being used correctly. You know, is the, are those passwords being stored encrypted? So, uh, Sierra will check that as well. Yeah, so it, it'll actually dump the keychain. You know, obviously, we're using jailbroken device, but it'll log in to your iOS device, dump the keychain, pull that back out, at which point you can actually check and decrypt your passwords that are stored or your session tokens that are stored in there to make sure that they're there and not floating somewhere else in the application directory. So we're going to give a demo here of it actually decrypting and analyzing the binary. Okay, so mind you, at this point, we've already taken a snapshot, and we are decrypting the binary. So again, this was the, uh, I guess we were testing a time management application. So we've, uh, we're in the process of decrypting the binary at this point. Uh, right now, uh, Sierra will do it via strings and class dump. So we can take a look at a lot of the header files to see what APIs they're using and so forth. Um, at, if you back up a little bit, you can see that um, prior to decrypting, obviously, we can't do anything. It's all encrypted. It's just it's a big blob of information. So if you if you pull the binary from the you know app store as it is, this is what you're going to see if you run a strings against that binary. It's just a bunch of decrypted or encrypted data. Okay, so now that we see the uh, now it's encrypted, well, we're going to decrypt it now. Okay, so we're going to use here for that. So Sierra does this automatically. Okay, and so as it's analyzing this binary, uh, you'll see it scrolling. We're going to scroll. Right now we're manually scrolling through the results at this point. But you'll notice um, some interesting things. Well, we have some SQL queries here. Okay, and uh, in addition to those SQL queries, we found some SQL injection. So, I mean, you can see that how Sierra comes into play here. Uh, if you have 10 apps to analyze and decrypt, Sierra can really help that. Yeah, so, you know, we're still scrolling through the decrypted application. Obviously, this is a lot of, these are a lot of SQL statements that we you know, may or may not be able to see, um, or we should, probably shouldn't be able to see. You know, the, the problem here is you see a lot of those percent, and percent, or, yeah, percent, at signs uh, where actual code is being appended. You know, they're using string concatenation to actually build those SQL queries, which is you know, SQL injection. That's a great thing there. So it's interesting if you look at that set of update statements kind of near the middle. So you can see that they've got the question marks in there, which means they were trying to do um, parameterized queries, uh, which usually works fine on a set or a where statement, but you can't do a parameterized query on the, the from clause, or in this case, the table that you're going to update. So the developer, rather than just finding some other way to do it, decided, oh, well, we'll just concatenate that part. That's what you're seeing on the, the percent at sign. Now, the one thing we are missing here is the actual you know, data that's being submitted into that NS string or whatever it is. Um, so, you know, it could be that they are, they have like a fixed string or something along those lines, and it may not be SQL injection, but there's enough information there for us to take that further and actually attempt to do SQL injection against this application because we know that exists. Otherwise, you know, maybe it's not as useful to us. Okay. So along with other feature that uh, Sarah has is analyze the snapshot we can analyze and decode the WebKit cookie binaries. Just a quick, Devo, sorry, quick question. Has anybody ever actually looked at that cookies, binary cookies file? That is a pain in my backside. Let me tell you what. Actually getting that to decode, we do it, you know, it, it works reliably now, but I spent a good week on that, just, just that one file. So, but it is what it is. It works now. So we analyze the uh, SQL database um, on the device, the plist, the text file, the XML, and the data files that's stored on the device by the application. Um, 
And there are a number of uh, files and things that we're not actually touching at this point, and we're still uh, flushing out exactly what Sierra understands. Uh, you know, things like image files we aren't really playing with yet. Um, some of the, you know, obviously text files are very easy to understand, but there's other stuff that's out there that we still need to figure out and decode. So if you run into something that you think is important, send it over to us. You know, send us an email, let us know, and we'll add it to our list and actually put the analyzer in there to analyze that file. So after we analyzed the snapshot, we're able to um, search for issues in the application itself. Um, along with that, we're looking for username, uh, password, session token, email addresses, um, URL also. Um, at that point, we can determine whether your application is setting data over HTTPS or HTTP. Um, another feature is Sarah also have a regex built in. You, are, you can also add in your custom regex in the future also. Yeah, and right now when you do a search through the data that's already been analyzed by Sierra, it'll, it, it just uses a regex is really what it boils down to. We have a bunch of them that are stored in the database, you know, that'll look for things like email address or password or username. But if you have a specific string that you want to search for, you can do that with Sierra as it stands today. So now we have a demo of the deco part of the serif. So right now I'm decoding an application on the device. After the decode is done, it stores the decrypted version on the device. So you, you can pull that off and then the run, run string where the um, Josh show you, uh, found all the um, SQL statement and all that. So right there, you can see where the uh, file is stored. And this one needs a search. So when you do um, analysis, you can do a search against the analyzed snapshot. You can search for username that you uh, use in the application. So for this instance, it, it say my username inside the plist also, the password is there in the clear text. Nothing encrypted. It's not in. You can also search for a company or a URL, and it will show you, you know, in the plist if it's there. Again, you're going to see quite a few, you know, anywhere that those regexes match, it's going to spit back data. In this case, it actually had the information contained in the analyzed files from, from Sierra. So um, Sierra also stored the data after the analysis. We, we save all that data. You can pull that onto your, your laptop. It's saved on your laptop. You can do um, analysis later on manually if you need to. Um, we also store it in the database. It's contained all the decoded and analyzed files uh, on the database itself. Yeah, so you've got a couple different ways that you can actually look at the information. Right? It's either through Sierra itself, it's through our little you know, Sierra lens, but you can also view it uh, on the file system itself. Those files are out there, the raw data is available either on the file system, or the SQLite database actually contains the analyzed files, so it's already decoded the plist for you, or it's decrypted the keychain for you. All that information is stored in that SQLite database, and you can go ahead and do whatever you want to it. And if you screw with it too much, Sierra won't be able to talk to it, but uh, that's up to you. All right, so we showed you this before. This is kind of what we, we imagine as the, the really cut down version of what an app assessment looks like on an iOS device. Uh, and Josh already talked through all this. There's a really detailed version of this on our white paper that's on your CD. So if you want to know what actually is involved in you know, abuse or in what you look for in the analysis, things like that, that's all there so you can look at it. Um, as we were going through this and manually you know, using Sierra to, to do all, help us with some of these steps, we realized, well, what if you have an intern or, or something else or somebody that just doesn't know this stuff very well and you want them to be able to do one? So there's some pieces of this puzzle that you don't want to give to someone who doesn't know what they're doing. But we made a feature called Cruise Control that does kind of the most annoying parts and does it 
in a way that it's totally guided. It's like a wizard interface. So you don't even have to know what you're doing. Sierra is going to tell you what to do at different points. It'll automatically do its parts. When it needs your help, it'll tell you, okay, do this, and then come back to me and do better, and so on. So we can go through the entire process of installation, use, and then analysis from those things, and with the snapshotting and things on the way, and then later on, you'll still have that analysis and snapshot saved so you can send uh, somebody else who does know what they're doing, or maybe, you know, I was using it earlier today because it's just easier than navigating through our menus to just run it through on the first pass with cruise control, and then we can come back later, do some abuse or whatever we need to do, and, and do the, the bottom loop again, essentially. So, uh, we're going to show you a little demo of that. So you guys are familiar with this by now. Um, so, before we get started on that, so we've cut out the first part. What Sierra will do is it'll ask you what you want to install and then go install it for you. That's the first step of cruise control. We cut that out because it takes a little time. So as of right now, you can see... Uh, so right here we see that uh, our target app is installed and then we're going to do our snapshot. So it's just going to run through. Do all that. This video is a little longer than the other ones. And actually, I should mention the reason we're doing all these in videos is because all of our communications are over wireless, and we didn't want a hostile audience, you know, messing with our talk. So uh, we decided to pre-record them. Uh, so right now, you can see that Sierra has said, "Okay, you're good to go." It asked if you wanted to use a proxy or not. We said no for this. And it's telling you, okay, go use the application like you normally would. Log in, sign up for an account, whatever it is. So the user is typing this stuff in now. This is not automated. Um, but it's waiting. And then when the user is done signing up, this was Devo doing this one, then he's going to come back to Sierra and hit enter, and then Sierra will take over. Uh, we actually were talking uh, about a week ago about, oh, well, we should use the iProxy for this so then we can do our demos on the stage. Uh, as it turns out, iProxy has a neat little hang-up uh, it only forwards one port at a time, is that right? Mm -hmm. And so we have multiple SSH connections going on at the same time here, and so we couldn't forward them all to do this. So we tried to, to uh, get you guys a live demo, but we just weren't able to pull it off the time. So you can see now that we, we used it, we pulled some new files, copied them over, analyzing them, automatically analyzing them, uh, and then after we automatically uh, analyze and that's where we like do all the decodes. So we change uh, a binary plists into a text format. We change uh, SQLite databases into something easy to read and so on and store all those up. Um, then it asks you, okay, what was it you wanted to look for? So uh, we've typed in some things here. Typed in David. Oh, we found it here. We typed in password. Oh, we found that there. So on. So typed in password and there was his password again. So you can just keep on going through that loop of search for whatever you need to search for until you're done. And then later on, if you've done something else, you can come back to this same snapshot of all the files and do further analysis on it. Now let's talk a little bit about requirements. Um, we didn't know that uh, Backtrack R3 was coming out today. Uh, so we did all our targeting to R2. It'll probably work fine in R3. You haven't tested it yet. Um, we've also played with it a little bit on Mac and Windows, but we are really focusing on getting it to work in Backtrack. Uh, you'll need Python, it comes with Backtrack, you'll be fine there. And uh, you'll need a jailbroken iOS device. We were testing on 5.1.1. Uh, you need to have, before you run, before you can do anything, you need Cydia installed with the developer section, and you can change that in settings if when you first jailbroke it you didn't pick developer. Uh, you need SSH installed, and you need to know your password and all that. Um, and you need apt installed. Uh, you'll also probably want to throw away App Store account. Uh, Apple hasn't shut any of ours down yet, but I figure it's only a matter of time. Uh, so don't use one that you care about. Also, don't hook up a credit card to it unless you're willing to pay for things that happen to automatically get installed. Uh, a lot of the decisions we made on what we would include and how we would do things were based on the fact that there's a lot of overhead in involved in doing an iOS assessment. Um, in a lot of cases, you have to install compilers, compile your own stuff, you have to you have to own an Apple. If you don't own an Apple, sometimes it's a problem. So whenever we made a decision, we were trying to make it as easy as possible. So we know everyone uses Backtrack, so we said instead of targeting specifically Apple, let's just make sure it runs in Backtrack. Um, 
once you've got those requirements installed that we talked about on your device, there's an option in Sierra that says, okay, now install all the rest of the things that Sierra needs. It'll automatically connect to the device and install all the other things it needs to run. There's a similar function on the host thing where you tell Sierra, okay, set up this computer and it'll install whatever it needs on this computer too. I'm just trying to make it easy to get started and get going in application assessment. Um, it looks like we lost part of the slide here. Um, no, is that all there? Release for now. Uh, we're going to release it, like Seth said, sometime in the next uh, day or two. Uh, it'll be linked here, seratool.com. We will tweet at, at seratool when it's out. Uh, in addition, we're licensing uh, Creative Commons free for non-commercial use. So if you want to use it yourself and tinker around with it, or if you're a nonprofit or educational facility, um, you feel free to use it. If you're going to use it for commercial stuff, come talk to us. We're still figuring out the details. Uh, we may open source it eventually. We just don't. We haven't decided what all is going to happen there. Um, so one of the things that we wanted to do was also talk about how prevalent these issues are. So, you know, it's easy to say, well, sometimes there's a problem here. But what we really wanted to know is how bad is it? How often do these things come up? So, um, one of the things that we wanted to implement, it's still on our list, and we're almost there, but we didn't have a chance to implement it in time to do our testing with it, um, was to look at the kinds of apps that will access your contact data, access your uh, calendar, your geolocation data, all that stuff. Um, we got an email from Bitdefender. They have a neat app called Clueful, which has uh, been pulled from the App Store. I don't know if it's back yet. Uh, but what they did, they were doing some analysis of these kinds of issues uh, by hand, and then you could run the Clueful app and, and look up an app that you have and see if that app causes these problems. So Clueful running on the phone doesn't do the analysis. They did the analysis in-house, and then you just get to look it up. Um, so as you can see, it's pretty prevalent according to them. So uh, most things encrypt their stored data, but still that's over 40% that don't. Um, not quite half things will look at your geolocation. 20% of things will look at your address book. 30% will display ads, which includes a lot of tracking data whenever you do ads, because almost always they'll send your UDID or something like that. And then what'll happen is the ad network can correlate your use of all the different apps, even though each of the apps couldn't do it themselves. Uh, which is why that's a problem. And then uh, we've got about 16% that go to Facebook. So some of these numbers, you know, 18%, it, it's not a majority, but at the same time, 18% of 650,000 apps is still a lot of apps that are getting into your address book. Uh, hopefully in iOS 6, that'll be a little better, but we'll see what happens. Um, so what we were able to do, we looked at, instead of the things that they were looking at, uh, Devo did most of these 50 apps, and in those we wanted to see how many of them stored a username in some sort of clear text, about half. How many of them stored a password in clear text, about 10%. And how many had some sort of session token in clear text that you could get to, and that's about 20%. Um, the apps that we picked were pretty random, just based on things that you know our team uses regularly, so it's, it's some of it's things you've heard of, some of it's probably things you've never heard of. Uh, so I, I worry about these numbers too. And really to me, both, both these numbers and these numbers are bad in my mind, and I don't know why these things don't get more attention. And I think that part of the problem is that these things don't really come up until the tools get so easy that any script kitty can do it. And then all of a sudden the media catches on. If you look at things like, you know, someone, if you transmit your session token in a cookie in clear text, then someone could take over your uh, logged in session. Nobody cared about that until somebody wrote Firesheet. And now all of a sudden it's a huge deal. So we're trying to get this to a point where script kitties can do enough that we can start seeing these issues become discussed and then we can have application developers start paying attention to this and, and make our apps more secure. Um, overall, we saw, I mean, this data was all over the place. Some of it was in SQLite databases. Some of it was in plist files. Some of it was in HTML5 local storage. Some of it was in the cookies binary cookies file. Uh, all those things we could decode easily. Uh, 
things that we'd like to do later. We want a GUI for sure. Uh, we want to have a nice way to report what happened during a session of, of Siri, Siri use. Uh, we want to be able to, we talked a lot already about being able to automatically drive the app. Once we get automatic driving done, we'll be able to uh, have a new feature called SQL, or Sira Drone. So the idea will be go get 50 apps and go run them and go analyze them and I'll go get some lunch. And it'll be able to do it all. It won't do it all right, but it's better than nothing. And when we're looking at this 650,000 apps plus 1,100 every day, there's no way, even if you look at all of the people in the world who are qualified to do this kind of work, there's no way that we could ever catch up. How many we would have to do when it takes us, you know, a couple weeks, how long, how many people would it take to catch up to 650,000 apps plus 1,100 every day? It's too many. So we need to find more ways to get some kind of basic analysis on as many things as we can. Even though we know that full automation isn't perfect, it's still better than nothing. We're also hoping to do some more memory hooking. We actually talked to some people at Arsenal yesterday that really wanted to see things happening in memory. Uh, it should be pretty easy to add with where we're at. Um, and we want to add more things we can look for both in memory when we get that and in files as they're there. We want to have everybody do this. I already said that. But what I really want to do is make a web page. So when you guys go out and do this on your own time because there's an app you really like and you want to see if it's secure, then why don't you upload it to a web page so other people who aren't as skilled as you can look at what you found and, and make their own decision about whether they want to use that app or not. That's where we want to go eventually. Um, furthermore, we could have it that developers could turn turn their app over to you know amateurs and crowdsource their security assessments at the same time that they submit something to the app store, and then people could bid on doing an assessment of various types, and then that would end up in that same web page that shows what happened. So you would have more transparent security in each of the apps that you use. That's where we'd like to see things happen. Things like Clueful are starting. They got the part right that they're making it easy for users to do it. I want to make it easy for everyone else to do the assessments as well. So, for that, that's all we got. Uh, please turn in your feedback forms. There's our email address and our Twitter. We've got a couple more minutes. Are there any yeah. questions? Questions. We left time for questions. No? Yeah. So we don't we don't use okay. The question was uh, if they use a, a flag to prevent GDB. We don't use GDB at all. Um, we're using uh, mobile substrate tweaks. We're actually using uh, it's called SciScript. We generate SciScript code on the fly and then inject that into the app we're messing with. So I don't know if those like anti debugger flags will will stop a mobile substrate tweak. Yeah, those, we're not going to have any defense against that yet. It's possible that if that starts to become more prevalent, and I'm not a big binary analysis person, but if someone else figures out, okay, here's how you put in those kinds of defenses and then somebody else breaks it, we're happy to put the break it part in the Sierra uh, if that comes up. We haven't seen that many. We've seen a couple that do that. Back here. We do no in-memory analysis right now. We have ways to hook in because we're using that to uh, like look at the, the app layout and stuff, but we haven't actually started in-memory analysis yet. That, that, that is on our roadmap. It's one of the things that's actually bumped up after having discussions with people mm -hmm. here this week. Yeah. Reading the source of the application? Huh. We could easily throw that in and, and analyze it in the same way that we're doing it here, just like we would the strings of the decrypted binary. I, there, there wouldn't be a problem with that. Um, you know, I would like to get to the point where we would understand that better, but we're not writing a static analyzer, right? Uh, we won't be at that level, but we would be able to recognize usernames and passwords and that kind of stuff in it. Again, we were kind of targeting letting people do this for themselves, and most people aren't going to have their own source, you know, of the, some app they ran. To, to do that kind of analysis. But Hence really the reason question. that you actually pull apps from the App Store before you analyze it, right? It installs apps from the App Store. I'm, I'm assuming right. that you don't have access to the source when you do that. Yep. Yeah. 
Sorry, I, I can't hear you. You know, right now we're targeting iOS. A lot of this would apply to Android. I mean, we, I, I was thinking about that uh, just a couple of days ago, using the ADB interface to actually pull the information back. And a lot of the strings that we're looking for could be applied there. Um, it's just a matter of where we want to spend our time and where we want to put our resources. There are a lot of security tools for Android. Um, I've been talking with Jack Menino a little bit about the stuff that he's developing along those along these same lines for Android. So maybe we'll implement some of it, maybe not. It just kind of depends on demand. We actually thought that there was a lot more attention to Android stuff already, and so we wanted to go the other direction. We Some of the tools that we had already seen were some of our inspiration for some of this. There was a tool for Android that we saw at Shmoo that did automatic diffing of the file system, so you could do those kinds of things, and we thought that was a great idea and picked it up for this. So I, I think that it's going to be there. It's not going to be us, most likely. So the, the question was, do we require you to download from the App Store? Right now, as of this minute, um, the cruise control part does. It assumes that you're doing a brand new app that you've never done before. You could do the steps by yourself, and, and they would all work using the manual menu. We've had that question about four times now, so we will take that out and add that, add that in an option in cruise control at the very beginning of, is this already installed? If so, what is it? Otherwise, go get it. Uh, and that'll be a really easy fix. Yeah, anyway, so go download it. Um, if you, you know, have more questions, feel free to come up and give us a holler. Um, if you're interested in getting into mobile analysis and mobile application security assessments, come give me, come talk to me. Um, you know, we're always looking for more people to help us out from the fishnet side of things as well. So, all right. If there's no more questions, thanks, everybody.